Megan Smith is the United States Chief Technology Officer. Okay, let's just acknowledge coolest job title. I'm, you, people must say this every time they introduce you. In the same way that it's cooler to be a prince than a king, I think Chief Technology Officer is pretty much the coolest job uh, I can think of in the United States. Um, I, I should say that for all introductions, we've given biographies in this, and we're going to try to keep these uh, short. So let me just say that um, Megan is in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Before she came to public service, she was a vice president at Google. And before that, as you can read about, she had adventures that are described, including at planetout.com and some cool solar car racing. And I'll let you read about that. Uh, so in the spirit of short introductions, thank you very much for coming, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, Faith. Thank, Faith, thank you, uh, Steve. Um, it's so great to be here. And uh, I do think CTO is such an honor to have this job. Although I would say there's somebody that really is the technologist in chief, and he'll be here tomorrow. Uh, uh, the president is really um, an incredible leader. And you know, I've come to government only in, you know, it's just shy of two years. But uh, the things that um, we just celebrated, Dr. Holdren, uh, the science advisor, um, who runs the Office of Science Technology Policy, he's the longest science advisor uh, since Vannevar Bush, longest serving uh, since FDR. And so we compiled a list uh, with our colleague Kristen Lee, who's here, of 100 achievements that the president has made just to celebrate. And it's just breathtaking to look at that. I encourage you to look on the web at the range of different things that are there. Um, so thank you, Stanford. Uh, you, we've really opened the doors this whole week. We're doing this event, but it's part of the whole Global Entrepreneur Entrepreneurship Summit. And again, the president is really a community organizer in his original first jobs. And it's really about getting talent together in the way that we're doing in the summit, in the way that we do in our country. And uh, a real opportunity to collaborate and uh, see um, people who have such different takes. Sometimes the president's chief of staff, uh, Dennis McDonough, calls it, we see different parts of the elephant. And so coming together and having the kinds of conversations that we can, whether it's in tonight about machine learning and AI and all of the opportunity and all the things we can do to avoid downside and collaborate on that, or whether it's the breadth of, of these particular days of the greatest entrepreneurs coming together to share with each other what they feel and are passionately driving uh, to bring us solutions into the world and uh, the network that they have together. Um, we are uh, also in the middle of really uh, working hard on um, how do we modernize our government itself? And I know that many uh, countries around the world are doing that. We have a thing called the Open Government Partnership, and it's a similar type of collaboration amongst countries. The president started it with about seven countries together. Now it's 70. We were just in Cape Town for the regional meeting of Africa and the steering committee. And it's great to see this healthy, collaborative, uh, engaged set of people working on government transparency, but also civic technology. One of the things that's really important here, we talked about data. Uh, the president's opened 180,000 data sets since coming into office, and so they live on data.gov, and people are starting to do extraordinary things. Of course, for many, uh, for a very long time, we've had weather and people building on top of that. We've seen mapping and those tools, but now we're starting to see things from census, like uh, engagement with the developer community on opportunity.census.gov. Um, which is now building applications on top of census, the biggest big data thing in our country. Um, and they're starting to move into a position where the developers and the technologists can really, we can have APIs in addition to RFPs coming out of government. <laughs> That's our goal. We also, some of my colleagues are here. I know uh, Lucy Brady is here somewhere from the United States Digital Service. And so this idea of the techies having a chair, and the president has added that uh, to make sure that the greatest technologists who have built Amazon and Facebook and Twitter, our research academy teammates, can come serve the government uh, in a tour of duty, just like our Surgeon General can come in, or the AAAS fellows or lawyers who rotate in. We're rotating technical people. That's very important for this particular conversation on AI machine learning, or whether it's about Bitcoin, or whether it's about uh, the new UAV 
UAS rules that have come out of the Department of Transportation this week around um, uh, uh, the regulation, the policy that should be here. We want the technical inventors of those technologies to be, in addition to consultation like we're doing tonight, to be able to be in the government together uh, so we have all of that American team together. And for our international colleagues who are here tonight, that seems to be happening all over the world. We're seeing whether it's the UK uh, government digital service, like our United States digital service, the French team, the Kenyan team, uh, Singapore, um, Brazil, China, uh, and uh, Chile, and others are all bringing technical people. We call it TQ, like IQ and EQ, added to the table uh, when we're doing policy making at government and when we're modernizing our systems so we can better serve citizens. And uh, as the president said at South by Southwest, not only do we want to modernize government um, and, and increase civic participation, but we have very hard challenges. So how can we solve problems in much more collaborative ways using all these new amazing methods, the sharing economy methods, open source methods? You know, we can make Wikipedia. Why don't we take that kind of technique and share with each other what we could do um, to improve economies and the social justice and social opportunity for everyone? So just, I wanted to turn attention specifically to, to the work on uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. The president really was encouraging us. There's, there's a whole range of opinions about what's going to happen. It's an exciting time. Some people are quite fearful. Some people are quite excited. And that range is a good range, and it's time for a deep conversation. And that's going to be ongoing, and it's got to be broader. And so what we're doing is a series of events and conversations, and this is one of them, the first one was at the University of Washington, which really focused on uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and law and policy. A series of experts from our country talking uh, and co having conversation and a dialogue there. Uh, recently, we had one with the, um, in, in Washington on AI for good. So how do we apply machine learning and even earlier, like just data science and d healthy data work, but this work into all of the problems I was just with, uh, David Newman is here uh, for the event. She's the deputy administrator of NASA. You know, so the NASA team has been using machine learning and AI, this techniques, we're going to Pluto, we're using this. But let's make sure in government, uh, our colleagues at the Department of Labor or the HUD team, we've released data there. Can we lift the capacity for them to serve the American people and to deliver their uh, quality products using artificial intelligence. So it was a conversation about AI for alleviating poverty, AI for uh, helping with climate change, AI uh, applications that we might use. And we heard from incredible experts doing work on wildlife conservation, doing work in Walter Reed with uh, medical decisions, really saving lives and uh, helping improve healthcare, um, criminal justice opportunities, and uh, similar things with uh, transportation, you know, and all the, of course, autonomous vehicles, but also routing uh, and saving people's time. So an amazing set of things. So that came out of the AI for Good conversation, and we'll continue here. Here at the Global Entrepreneurship Summit and at Stanford, you know, really a focus on entrepreneurship, on our greatest academics talking to us about what they see in the field, and we're going to hear about that. And then um, next week, we're going to be at Carnegie Mellon, and there's a conversation there about uh, safety and control and the conversations we need to begin to have as we develop and understand that. And then the last one is in New York City, and the Council of Economic Advisors team will be joining in that, Jason Furman, who leads that team, um, talking about sort of economics and social implications. And, and very much focused on the near term. You know, just like the, the jobs revolution of the industrial uh, and the industrial age and the transition we go through sort of every decade, you know, so many of the jobs in the United States today are new, you know, from companies, many founded here at Stanford, uh, who have created this future. Um, we were just over with an amazing uh, team called Shinola here, you know, the rebirth of Detroit. So, the re rebirth of our jobs, and this will have great implications there. And we need to have those conversations and be, be thinking about that. So that'll be uh, a focus in New York. There'll be a public report that comes out of this, uh, very similar to the work that uh, John Podesta led um, around big data. And so continuing that conversation. And also we're gonna be posting, I think on Monday, uh, uh, beginning our request for information so that we're online with anybody who would like to comment and uh, engage in the dialogue. All of the conversations we're having are live streamed and the videos of the ones in the past are posted, so if anyone wants to participate in those. Um, 
I think that uh, maybe the last thing I'd note uh, is really a, a really important thing that the president uh, cares a lot about, which is how are we going to make sure that we're bringing everyone into this conversation and that those who will design and make and participate in AI uh, and this incredible opportunity that we have will come from all parts of the world will be men and women, will be people of all races, and really represents humanity's greatest talent applied. So the diversity and inclusion here is a profound challenge because up to this point, many of the AI research teams have represented partial groups of the planet. We want to field the whole team. And so we've got really fundamental work that we need to recognize as we come into this conversation of how are we going to engage. Uh, the president has launched uh, Computer Science for All, Nine out of 10 parents in the United States would like coding taught at school. And so we're working hard to help make sure all our children are having the opportunity to participate in algorithms, data science, and we would love to have them in on this conversation. And by teaching in class, whether it's in the English class or whether it's you know, in a math class and computational thinking, you know, we'll be able to engage them into this conversation and the challenges that their world will become a part of uh, as we do so many different things. So the thing I might mention is that uh, yesterday we announced a tech inclusion pledge along these lines. So over 30 companies, uh, many of them here in Silicon Valley, uh, from uh, Intel, Airbnb, Zynga, and others, have signed up to really push hard on diversifying their workforce. And this is a workforce that is deeply involved in AI and machine learning. And so it's an exciting pledge. The teams are, are pledging to publish numbers and details about where the technical people really are in, in those teams. And they're going to be uh, setting goals. And then also collaborating together to try to really advance our knowledge. Much of our diversity challenges today live in unconscious bias and institutional bias. Um, you know, I just mentioned David Newman, an example there would be maybe even the basics of the NASA team. We stopped making small spacesuits. So the people who are small have a hard time, right? So why are we disincluding small people, right? So, so we're working on that. And one of my colleagues, Katie Coleman, who's a, an astronaut, has been to space three times, two times on the shuttle and once for six months on the station. She's one of the very smallest astronauts. And she said that you know, when she's in those suits underwater doing training, there's just twice as much air. It's much harder for her to physically do what she's doing. And so uh, what are we doing in our institutional design that's, that's systematically making it harder for people to play? Is it through the fact that our media shows 15 to 1 computer science boys versus girls in children's TV? And so when we watch TV, we see things that uh, make us think the world is a way that it doesn't have to be. So you know, I'll, I'll leave you with two of those images. And what can we do to include people and maybe AI machine learning can help us with the data science of seeing what we're doing. Uh, and so maybe one of the applications we should get up to is how to diversify the AI machine learning teams using AI machine learning. So I'm really excited to hear from the people that the Stanford team has pulled together uh, with us. And uh, it's an honor to be here with all of them and their just incredible passion you know, for the, the joy and discovery and what they've been up to and what they can bring and talk to us and how we can engage so many more people. And it's an honor to be here with our guests from around the world. Again, thank you for being here at the summit and your, for your entrepreneurial leadership. And I and really appreciate your joining into this conversation. Thank you. Miraculously, some time for one or two questions. This is a surprise feature of the program. <laughs> and I'll let you choose. Yes, yeah, so two people here. Yeah, there and how about there and then there? We'll have a microphone running over to so you. One, two. Hello. How are you? Good. Um, I really appreciate encouraging diversity. And there's another piece of diversity that needs to be included, or I would appreciate you considering. And that's the implications of social. Mm -hmm. How AI, how automation, how process, how script is going to work with people. 
mm -hmm. not just amongst machine to machine. And right. that's something that anthropologists, sociologists, others can help you with. Right. I think that sounds fabulous. And uh, you made me think of this idea, which was, uh, you know, definitely social is part of the, you know, like the New York conversation and some of that, the job side and that. But I think there's such opportunity here. And how creative can we be about engaging people? A friend of mine started a, a, something called the Ocean Elders. Um, and you think about all the sustainable development goals. You know, these, these goals that we have that are so important and the UN teams and the social teams and civic engagement teams work so hard to put those together across two years. For those who don't know, this is the, like the Millennium Development Goals of the first 15 years, this is the next 15 years. They were just ratified last, a year ago, September. And so I was imagining, uh, you know, sort of this engagement on social and getting young people involved. They're thinking about launching the youngers with the elders. Not necessarily age thing, but those who have great expertise and those who are working on it. And I always thought we should have the youngest which is the maybe three to seven year olds who get involved. And you could imagine them helping us as much as our most extreme experts, you know, envisioning what would it be in a world and sort of thinking about David Newman, who has a lot of science fiction imagery and posters around with NASA so they can imagine into the future. So how can we do two things? One is the very scientific part of this and sort of behavior science and, and how humans are. And then also the very imaginative, creative part. It would be really interesting to get up to both of those. I really appreciate. And people who have ideas, we'd love to hear how you would envision doing that in the different ways that capture maybe those three sectors, those who really know a lot and can lead, those who are very excited to work on that and have work in progress in our beginning, and maybe even the youngest of us who have the most creative, wild ideas of what it might be. I think just what I would leave you with, and those are all fantastic comments, is that as you consider AI and the technical possibilities, ultimately they are gonna impact people. Yes. And that really needs to be on board as you plan projects and make stuff. Yeah, it, I think it's critically important. I also feel like the, there's an opportunity even very near term that's not just pure AI, it's more um, systems, which is in the smart cities work, to be very mindful of not only the kind of uh, like the mechanical part of the city, you know, the oh. physically getting around, but the citizens. And so um, we've been working a lot with uh, police force on the police data initiative, other things around justice. Um, the, the CTO of Seattle uh, has been working with librarians and they've been doing extraordinary hackathons, hack the commute, work on our neighborhood, and really engaging anyone in the neighborhood with open data and really making it a community conversation. So I think anything we can do along those lines is critically important and uh, kind of all voices in and structuring using clever ways and those who have ideas there can bring a lot. Thank you. Thanks. We had one more question. Yeah, are we okay on time? We're out of, we're out of time. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.